And we're going to start with St. Augustine, like we always do. Um, and this is for his prayer. I, you know, in my Augustine day by day, this is the prayer for today, and it's beautiful. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we remember that you told us that when two or more are gathered in your name, you are here among us and we believe you. So we know that you are part of this group. Um, you have the best uh, equivalent of Zoom that there is. And uh, and we, we ask that you stay with us during this study and help us to understand what it is you want us to know. So this is from... St. Augustine's Commentary on Psalm 18. <clears throat> Lord, you help us as we move toward you. Grant that we may never attribute to our own wisdom the fact that we are converted to you. Neither let us ever attribute to our strength the fact that we actually reach you. In this way, we will avoid being repelled by you who resist the proud. And our prayer is, Lord, help us so that a change may be achieved in us and we find you ready to offer yourself for the enjoyment of those who love you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I am excited about this study, and I think you will be too. Uh, this uh, study on the letter to the Hebrews, and the first thing you're going to learn is it's not a letter at all. Uh, it, it became a letter later, but initially, uh, in very short, in a very short time, you'll see that this was intended to be um, a homily. And it's uh, it, and it, it even just descri describes itself as a word of exhortation, which is a phrase that's that you find also in Acts of the Apostles in describing Paul's preaching, a word of exhortation. This is a word of exhortation. Um, uh, so the it and it, it also doesn't have a lot of the other features that Paul's letters have. Um when I remember when I was little and would go to mass, um, and this part of this would be read, the whoever was was reading would sometimes say um, uh, a reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, and this was attributed to Saint Paul. Well, now they just say a reading from the letter to the Hebrews, and there the the. the um, the church has acknowledged that this letter is formally anonymous. So it does not like in some of Paul's other letters, you'll have something like Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, or, you know, or some other introduction where Paul will refer to himself, you know, as a follower of Christ. There is no self-identification in this letter. And if you think about it, a homily doesn't need identification because you can see the homilist. You know who it is who's delivering the homily. So initially, this was uh, given as a homily and eventually written down. Um, the, the other thing, for, for those people who know Greek, and who enjoy reading the New Testament in Greek. And I am not yet one of those, um, but I hope to be. The the you would be you will be initially struck by the richness of the Greek. Whoever authored this letter was extremely literate, you know, very well educated, um, very sophisticated language very uh, intricate in the craftsmanship that went into the the preparation of this of this homily if you were to stand up and just read from you know chapter 1 to chapter 13 you know the the entirety of the letter to the hebrews and you were you would you were to read it as if you were 
um, you know, reading it at mass, it would take you about 45 minutes. So um, it's not extremely long. Um, and that's about the time that a back back in the day, uh, a homily would take it would take about 40 to 45 minutes. Today, as you know, um, Pope Francis has cautioned priests that if you haven't made your point in seven minutes, quit boring. Uh, so uh, the 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 uh, mindset has changed from the earliest days to now. Um, there are some there there were there have been debates uh, pretty much since the earliest times as to who was the author of this letter. And there's all kinds of good reasons why um, somebody would be considered an author versus somebody else. You know, uh, whoever wrote it clearly moved in Paul's circle because they're very familiar with Paul's themes. Um, uh, however, as, as was pointed out by a couple of the early church fathers, uh, Paul's Greek was not this good. Um, Paul's Greek was good, but not excellent like this is. Um, there are, you know, like over a hundred words uh, that are um, more sophisticated words that are only found in the in the whole New Testament. They're only found in the letter to the Hebrews. So, you know, whoever wrote it was a scholar and a scholar of the Old Testament because they know very well uh, the Hebrew scripture and they know Hebrew customs. So that would match with Paul, but it also matches some other people. Uh, one of the candidates for authorship is Barnabas. Uh, as, as you might remember from when we studied Acts of the Apostles, Barnabas was from the tribe of Levi. He was from a priestly class. So um, he also would have been very intimately familiar with uh, Hebrew scripture and Hebrew and, and Jewish customs. Um, so, you know, the customs of Judaism, the practices of Judaism, the author of this letter is too. Um, so Barnabas was one of the candidates that was considered and in fact argued for uh, by a number of prominent people. Apollos is another one. Um, Apollos, who was from Alexandria, and uh, but you know, so primarily Greek speaking, um, you know, would be another candidate. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. The church, you know, says that it is formally anonymous. In other words, it, it, they, they made it a point not to identify the author. That's fine with us. The church has recognized this as being inspired and has included it as part of the canon from the earliest times. And so do we. It was part of the liturgy from the earliest times. And that's one of the criteria for being uh, accepted into the canon. Um, the, uh, the, the focus, um, oh, okay, let me, let me back up. We all know that, you know, Paul's, one of Paul's main focuses is on the resurrection. In fact, he tells us with out the resurrection, our faith is foolish. So the resurrection is central to Paul's teaching. For this author, what th this author goes beyond the resurrection. What is central to this author is that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, and that Jesus Christ is central to the heavenly liturgy of which our earthly liturgy is a participation this letter is the it, it's where we when when we hear jesus referred to as our great high priest or our high priest it comes from the letter to the hebrews it is one of the central themes of the letter to the hebrews is that we have a great high priest for those of you who go to Mass every Sunday and have done so for years, you will recognize, you may you may not have remembered that those parts of Scripture come from the letter to the Hebrews, but you're going to recognize big parts of the letter to the Hebrews. It has become not just part of our readings, but also part of our prayers. 
So this is all going to sound very familiar. Priest, prophet, king, you know, that well, that is our participation in the priesthood of Christ. We are priests, prophets, and kings. That comes from letter to the Hebrews. Um, there's there's just a lot, there's a lot here. We don't know who the letter was specifically written to. We do know that they were uh, most likely primarily Greek speakers, not Hebrew speakers, although they would have known or at least been able to read Hebrew. And um, there's, a, there's an emphasis on the priesthood and also on the liturgy. This letter is written to a community that had originally been Jewish, converted to Christianity, and that now enough time has passed since their conversion that they're starting to backslide. You're going to find some very contemporary themes in this study that what the author says sounds like it was written last week. And, and what the author is exhorting is happening now, either in ourselves or in people we know. You know, this is, um, it, uh, uh, this is not an, it is an ancient text, but it has very uh, present day application. Um, maybe even more so than in past ages. So you're going to find this study extremely relevant. Um, so it, the, the community is not, we don't know who it was written to, but we do know that they were Christians and that they primarily spoke Greek and that they, which meant they probably did not live in Jerusalem or, or the immediate surroundings. They, they probably lived in the diaspora. There, there's uh, a lot to argue that they were probably, if not in Rome, certainly in the Roman, uh, within the Roman region. Um, it talks about, uh, the, the letter talks about persecutions. And it looks, it, it, it looks back on a persecution and is also anticipating a persecution to come. That, that might, uh, it's, so that's a good argument for arguing that this was written after, remember when, when the emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from, from Rome? That's how, remember, that's how Priscilla and Aquila, uh, or Priscilla and Aquila ended up in Ephesus. Uh, Paul meets them in Ephesus, remember? And they were tent makers. And so Paul hooks up with them. Um, and they had come from, from well, in it says they had come from Italy in Acts of the Apostles. It, it says they came from Italy, but they had they had been expelled uh, in that when Claudius expelled all the the Jews from Rome because of all the fighting, all that was going on about some guy named Christus, uh, Christos. Uh, so that has already happened. the The temple is still there, and probably the the persecution that they're anticipating is the persecution of Nero, which is uh, in the mid sixties. And that's where Paul and Peter, you know, end up being um, executed. Um, let's see. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I'll, I'll let, um, I'll see what, what Jeff includes and, um, uh, and then what's not included, I'll fill in. These sessions are short. They're, you know, not more than half an hour, you know, or like 28 to 32 minutes. So these are short. And I, at first I was tempted to do two in one session, but it, it it would be way too much. I mean, it's it's profound and you need to take in what what we're told in the video and as Deacon uh, Ray Helgeson would say, you need to marinate in it, okay? You need to roll it around, you know, taste it for a while, um, sit with it, uh, because it is, it is profound. Um, I can see where this letter influenced 
uh, Pope Benedict when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger and, and writing Spirit of the Liturgy. There's a lot of of Letter to the Hebrews in in Ratzinger's uh, Spirit of the Liturgy. And if you've not read that before, uh, make sure you're well rested when you start. Uh, but there are there are parts that will cure your insomnia, but there are other parts only because, you know, Benedict is so, I mean, he's such a professor that um, if you're not up there with him, he'll put you to sleep. But there are other parts where it'll make you cry. That spirit of the liturgy can be so touching, it will bring you to tears. So it, uh, I, I, I think that Benedict is in the future going to be declared a doctor of the church, and that's going to be one of his writings that will be the foundation for it. Okay, I, normally I don't start with uh, with the introduction, but this one is good, so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to, without any further ado, um, start. Let's see. I see one. Uh, okay. Let me. You're you're sharing your screen, right? Yes. You're ready. Okay. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Let me. Okay. Why aren't you letting me share? It still says host disabled participant screen sharing. I just checked my uh, my thing again. So hopefully I re-clicked it. So hopefully now it will work. Ah, there we go. Yes. Hi, I'm Jeff Cavins, and uh, along with me once again, Dr. Andrew Swafford, and uh, you're in for a treat because we're going to be taking a look at the letter to the Hebrews, and this is an amazing book, isn't it? It's just breathtaking. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. You're going to really, really love this one. You know, the letter to the Hebrews is one of those books that if you've read it once or twice, it probably brought up a lot of questions. And there's an awful lot of imagery that people don't understand, but they're familiar with things like a tabernacle, the holy of holies, the priest, the high priest sacrifice, uh, Mount Sinai. You know, it goes, it goes on and on. But in this study, we're going to go deeper into this letter. And it's kind of like a like a time travel, if you will. We're going to go clear back to Mount Sinai. It's a lot like the book of Revelation, which is really the most steeped book of the New Testament in the Old Testament. If you don't know the old, it's hard to know what's going on here. But as you say, Hebrews has one foot in the old and one foot in heaven itself. Exactly. So you have kind of stops along the way. You got the Old Testament, the time of David, the time of Jesus, our time today, and how the truths of the letter to the Hebrews impact our life. And then, of course, in heaven. And uh, I got this funny feeling that people who are around during Moses' time in the tabernacle, and they get to heaven, they're going to say, there's a pattern. Yes, they're going to say, wow, I saw the foreshadowings of this, and now I see the true reality toward which it was pointing the whole time. I want to encourage you about this particular letter. If you've never been through a study like this before, Dr. Andrew Swafford is going to walk us through it, and it is truly going to be a life changer. Pray that the Lord will show you uh, the truths of the letter, letter to the Hebrews and how it has an impact in your life today, and particularly in the Mass, right? You'll never, ever go to Mass the same way again after having gone through a thorough study of the book of Hebrews. All right, put your seatbelt on for this time travel, and God bless you as you go deep into the letter to the Hebrews. Welcome. I am so excited to be with you. I love this book. I love the book of Hebrews, and I pray that it'll be a powerful and moving experience for you as well. Let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Uh, Lord, we give you thanks and praise, honor and glory. We give you thanks for your word, for your word of God in scripture, your word of God made flesh in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for your word made flesh in the Holy Eucharist. We pray that we may see all this come together. This may be an encounter with your son and our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name as we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I said, I am so excited uh, to be with you all today. And I, I personally could never, ever have seen myself here. I, I, uh, I grew up Catholic, but uh, basically a name only. And I had a, a massive conversion in college. But for me, the, the Bible is a big part of my conversion because they, like a lot of people, it's easy to say, oh, I, Jesus is pretty cool. I love Jesus. But church, sacraments, oh, I don't know. But for me, connecting Jesus to the church, Jesus to the sacraments, Jesus to the larger story of ancient Israel was powerful for me. And I, I had some great guides, some great Bible teachers. And if you've ever been on a trip, maybe a pilgrimage, you know what a great guide can do. And if you've ever been blessed enough to go to the Holy Land with Jeff Cabins, you know exactly what I mean. A guide who not only knows the information, the content, but can set the tone, the ethos in which you can have a life-changing experience. I would propose to you Hebrews as that guide. Hebrews as that guide that's sort of like walking into the holy of holies of biblical theology. That just opens up new vistas and powerfully explains and unveils and distills for us the way in which Jesus Christ is not an add-on to the biblical story. But he's the fulfillment of not only the story of Israel, but the story of humanity. A story begun so long ago. For many people know Hebrews through a few famous passages. For example, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Or here's one that you probably know as well. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13.8. As powerful as those verses are, there's so much more you can get out of this study. For example, what is the new covenant? And what is the mystery of Christ for these earliest Christians? Did they think of themselves as spiritual and not religious? Or did they see the liturgy and especially the Eucharist as the chief means by which they entered the mystery of Christ? As we'll see later on, it's the latter. How did they view their relation to the old covenant? Did they subscribe to the view that says, Old Testament God bad, New Testament God good? Or did they see the Old Covenant as, the, as an earthly foreshadowing of the heavenly reality that has dawned in Christ? Once again, as we'll see, it's the latter. Let's just touch base on a few key themes that we're going to see throughout. Uh, the first one is one we'll come back to again and again. Divine intimacy. Divine intimacy. See, we're going to see that salvation is not just a divine acquittal. God is not just a judge who acquits us and wipes the slate clean. Salvation is ultimately about divine sonship, becoming a child of God, sharing in the eternal, feely relationship our Lord Jesus Christ has to the Father. See, it's so much more than just forgiveness of sins. It's about healing and transformation. And to that extent, salvation is not just about the future. It's not just about how do I get to heaven. It's happening right now. Because we all have wounds. We all have scars. And salvation is not just an acquittal, not just wiping the slate clean, but God entering into those wounds, into those scars, bringing about his work of healing and transformation. An image that I like to use with students is the image of a nail in a piece of wood. If forgiveness signifies pulling that nail out of the piece of wood, what's still left? There's still a hole in the wood. Salvation is not just pulling the nail out. Salvation is filling that hole with divine life, bringing about a work of not just forgiveness, but healing and transformation. This is what divine intimacy is all about. This is about the nuptial marriage between humanity and divinity that's been ushered in in Jesus Christ. The second theme for us is that this document is liturgical. And by liturgical, we mean the community gathered in worship together together worshiping Jesus and worshiping Jesus in the Eucharist. So we mean this, how is this document liturgical? In two ways. One, there's a lot of Eucharistic teaching that's going to come about. But secondly, 
This document seems to be an ancient homily first delivered in the context of the communities gathered in liturgical worship of the Holy Eucharist. Now, why would people think that? Well, by the end of the document, it's called it calls itself a word of exhortation in 1322. Uh, that same phrase is used to describe a homily or a sermon elsewhere. For example, in Acts 13.15 with Paul in a sermon he gave at Pisidian Antioch. So the first reason is the document calls itself a, quote, word of exhortation. Secondly, even though we call it the letter to the Hebrews, it doesn't have those kind of letter type markings at the beginning, as do other letters, for example, of St. Paul. In other words, you don't have anything like Paul to the church at Corinth or Paul to the churches of Galatia. Uh, there's nothing like that. The, the document just jumps right in. It never names the author, and it never names the recipient, as is typical in a letter. But that would make sense if it's a homily, because the congregation can see the one preaching to them. Thirdly, there's several references to speaking and hearing. So, for example, Hebrews 2.5, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. Or in Hebrews 5.11, about this we have much to say. In other words, there's a number of references to speaking and hearing as would make sense if this were a homily given in a liturgical gathering. This is going to be extremely significant because given the context of this document in a liturgical gathering, a liturgical assembly gathered in a Eucharistic liturgy that only heightens the Eucharistic and liturgical meaning of the words of this ancient text. A third theme we're going to see, heaven on earth, heaven on earth, from imitation to participation. What do I mean by that? In the old covenant, old covenant worship, old covenant liturgy, there was a sense in which what they were doing on earth, the temple on earth, was an imitation of what was going on in heaven, an imitation of the heavenly liturgy in the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly temple. This all perhaps begins with, if you were to look at Exodus 25, verse 9, or Exodus 25, verse 40, this is when Moses is receiving the instructions for the tabernacle on Mount Sinai. And in those verses that I mentioned, Exodus 25, verse 9, Exodus 25, verse 40, God says to Moses, make the tabernacle according to the pattern being shown you on the mountain. That is to say, make the earthly tabernacle, the earthly sanctuary, according to the pattern of its heavenly counterpart. So there grew this lively sense for the ancient Jews that their worship, their liturgy, their temple was an imitation of what was going on in heaven, an imitation of the heavenly temple, of the heavenly liturgy. But in Christ, in Christ, heaven and earth have been reconciled. Heaven and earth have come together. In Christ, therefore, new covenant liturgy. New covenant worship is not an imitation of the heavenly. It is now a participation in the heavenly liturgy. It is now a sharing in the worship of heaven. Jesus has reconciled heaven and earth, and he has taken us there with him. And so in our Eucharistic liturgy, in our Eucharistic worship, it's no longer an imitation of the heavenly. It's a participation in the heavenly. It's a sharing in the heavenly itself now. I promise if you stick with me, if you stick with me, you'll never go to Mass the same way again. The fact is the incarnation changed everything. The incarnation, God becoming man and Jesus Christ changed everything. There's lots of old covenant mediators, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, but they all have some failing. The grand lesson of the Old Testament is that the gift of the law is good, is holy, is beautiful, but the law illumines sin, exposes sin, shines a spotlight on sin, but the law does not give the power to overcome sin. The heart surgery ancient Israel needed is not simply the gift of the law, but the gift of the Spirit through Christ that empowers us to do what we couldn't do on our own. I mean, have you ever had the experience of knowing what you should do or knowing what you shouldn't do and then doing it anyway? I know I have. Sin, my friends, is not an intellectual problem. We needed more. 
And that's part of the grand lesson that these old covenant mediators could not do. Only the God man could be faithful to the end. Only the God man who takes on our human nature, enters fully into our plight, heals our broken nature and infuses it with his divinity. In Jesus, human nature is healed, perfected and elevated. This is how Jesus has reconciled heaven and earth. We'll see this much more fully as we go. Who wrote this ancient document? Who wrote this masterpiece? Let's just start with what we can glean clearly from the text. This is someone very fluent in Greek. Let me just give you just some examples of the, just the masterful play of ancient Greek that this author has. So if you look, were to look at Hebrews 5, 8, for example, which says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Kyber on weas emethen haf on epithen tain hubakuin. If you look at he learned emethen and he suffered epithen, they differ by one letter. You hear it? Emethen, he learned. Epithen, he suffered. It's a masterful play of words here in ancient Greek. Emethen, he learned. Epithen, he suffered. Again, they differ by one letter. One letter. Or another example, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. Twelve words in this verse, five of which begin with P, the pi. Three of the first four words begin with P. Palermeros, kai palutropos, palai, pathos, lesos. So there's just a, a masterful play of Greek. It's probably the most exquisite Greek in all of the New Testament here in the letter of the Hebrew. So clearly we have someone who is a master of ancient Greek. Secondly, as you're going to see, this author is a master of the Old Testament. This author has a command of the storyline and the details and all the ins and outs of the Old Testament. So command of Greek, command of the Old Testament. So is this from the hand of St. Paul? Certainly he would fit the bill, master of Greek, master of the Old Testament, St. Paul, who, for example, studied under the greatest rabbi of the day, Gamaliel. St. Paul, who was a Roman citizen. And you do have at the end of this document in 1323, a reference to, quote, our brother Timothy. That's in 1323, our brother Timothy. So Paul clearly could fit the bill. And there are some other similarities with Paul. For example, the ultimate inadequacy of the law. As I said, the law shines a spotlight on sin, illumines sin, but does not give the power to overcome sin. We certainly see that in Romans and Galatians, and we see it in the letter of Hebrews. You also have Christ's redemptive obedience, that's a theme you see in Paul. For example, in the Philippians hymn, uh, chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, speaking of Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but emptied himself to him in the form of a servant, even to death, death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him that at his name every knee should bend. So you do have some similarities. Yet, on the other hand, uh, there are some distinctive Pauline phrases like in Christ, in Christ Jesus that occur everywhere in Paul that are absent here in Hebrews. So it's probably best to think of this as coming from within the Pauline circle, but we probably shouldn't say much more than that. Some in the other church thought it was from Paul and some didn't. So there was dispute even from the beginning on that question. The audience, clearly Greek speaking, but also from a Jewish background, also from a Jewish background. How about the date? At what point are we talking about in this first generation of Christians? Probably in the mid-60s. Probably in the mid-60s. Why? Well, as Jesus prophesied the fall of the temple, which was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, he prophesied that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, that within a generation, the temple would be destroyed. And when you think generation... Think the ancient wilderness wandering. Think that 40-year wander in the wilderness. He says those words around AD 30, and the temple is destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. Uh, so it, it seems to be the case that that has not yet happened, but it's on the near horizon. And that's the reason for putting this document somewhere in the early to mid-60s. Uh, for example, if you look at Hebrews 10, 11, there is a statement that implies that sacrifices in the temple are still ongoing in the present. The sacrifices are still ongoing. Sacrifices which obviously ended when the temple is destroyed. There's no more sacrifices after that in 70 AD. So if you look at Hebrews 10, 11, 
and says this, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So the fact that it implies that sacrifices are still going on in the present tells us we're priests every AD. Take a look now at Hebrews 8.13. Speaking of a new covenant here, as we'll get to, the author is quoted from Jeremiah 31, the famous new covenant prophecy. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So there's this sense that the temple has not yet fallen, but it's about to. It's, 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 in, it's in view. Jesus' prophecy is coming to fruition. What's happening in, the, in terms of the broader storyline of the New Testament is that the temple made of stone, the temple of brick and mortar, is giving way to the temple of Christ's risen body. Much more on that to come. Let, let's, let's talk for a minute, though, about what the temple meant. What was the temple? Estimates are that in Jesus' day, the temple complex took up 25% of the city of Jerusalem. 25%. Jerusalem was more like a temple with a city around it rather than a city with a temple in it. Imagine having the White House, the Supreme Court, Wall Street, and the Vatican all wrapped up into one. In a real way, this is the temple. The temple in a concrete and practical way was the world for the ancient Jews. So just feel what it would mean for this temple to be destroyed, for this temple to give way. Further, at a theological level, the temple was understood as a microcosm of creation. There's lots of Edenic creation images in the temple, for example, like the cherubim that overshadow the uh, Ark of the Covenant as the cherubim were in the Garden of Eden. So the, the temple, uh, in some ways, was heaven on earth, because that's where God dwelt. It was also a microcosm of creation, kind of a return to Eden. It, it embodied their whole world, as I mentioned, White House, Supreme Court, uh, Wall Street, and the Vatican together. Think of the temple as an embodiment of creation and an embodiment of the Old Covenant. And so when it gives way, it is truly in the Jewish mind, the end of the old creation and the definitive giving way of the old covenant. Because what's going on here is the giving way of the old and earthly and the ushering in of the new and heavenly. What's going on, as I said, is the giving way of the temple made of stone. Giving way to the temple of Christ's risen body, Christ's risen bodies we'll see, which is present in the Holy Eucharist. So what we have here is a very early document in the first generation of Christians that sees the Eucharist as the bridge between heaven and earth, as the way by which we access heaven on earth. We also have here uh, a clear call to hope and perseverance. There's definitely a context of suffering and persecution in the background, uh, a, a persecution that, that is in the uh, near past but also that is on the horizon and therefore a call to perseverance. So for example, if you look at Hebrews 10, 32 and following, let's go ahead and read that together. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, uh, that word with photizo there, that's a reference to baptism whereby we receive the light of Christ. So Hebrews 10, 32, the former days when after you were enlightened and you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on the prisoners, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that you may do the will of God and receive what is promised. There's a danger in the background of a relapse to the old covenant. There's, there, there's this sense brewing in Hebrews that they are called to embrace, to get through this new wilderness period. There's been a new exodus. They're going through a new wilderness wandering. And persevering in faith, as we'll see, is embracing the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly new covenant, covenant gathered around in worship of the risen lamb. And to fall in the wilderness, as their ancient forefathers did back in the book of Numbers, is to cling to the earthly. So if you were to look at, say, for example, Hebrews 13, 9, there's a reference to foods and, and things like that. And it, it, what's behind that is a clinging to jewish law jewish dietary laws and the like and so what what's going on here and what we should really stress is though when we think of persecution in the other church 
we always jump to the Roman period. We jump to Nero. We jump to Nero beheading St. Paul. We jump to Nero crucifying Peter upside down. Those two great saints, Peter and Paul, who consecrate ancient Rome with the blood of their martyrdom. But if you read Acts of the Apostles, you can see clearly that the first wave of persecution did not come from the Romans. The first wave of persecution came from the Jewish leaders. Now, there are many Jewish leaders that were righteous and good. Think of Nicodemus. Think of Joseph of Arimathea. Think of Gamaliel, Paul's ancient teacher. But there are also other Jewish leaders that persecuted the early church. That's really the first wave of persecution. Think, for example, of Saul, who became St. Paul. So that first wave is not the Romans. The first wave is the Jewish leaders, uh, many of them, not all, but many of them. And that creates a temptation then to return to the old covenant to ward off this persecution. Keep in mind the Jewish-Roman war that breaks out in 66 AD. Imagine the faith it would have taken ancient Jewish Christians to not partake in that. Imagine your father, your brothers, your uncles, and, and, and the rebellion is about to break out. And they know they're outmatched, but they look back at the ancient Maccabees that fought off ancient Greeks, won a battle against all odds because the Lord was with them. Imagine these brothers, your father, your uncle saying, hey, hey, are you with us? And you're like, yeah, you know, dad, I, I, think the, I think the kingdom's here. Where is it? Well, it's, it's spiritual. Are you with us or not? Are you going to fight with us or not? I think the Messiah has come. Okay. Uh, it's Jesus. That dude that was crucified back uh, not too long ago, are you kidding me? Are you going to be with us or not? I mean, the faith it would have taken to cling to Jesus, to cling to the heavenly new covenant in that context, I think we dramatically underestimate. And as we're going to see, it's not simply earthly and spiritual. The contrast, rather, moving from the old to the new, is earthly and heavenly. Because something can be heavenly and visible like the incarnation, like the resurrection, like the Eucharist. This is what we're moving toward. But just go back and think about the faith it would have taken these ancient Christians, who all of whom are from a Jewish background initially, to persevere in faith and embrace Jesus as the fulfillment of the faith of their childhood. All right, let's recap. Here we have an early document before AD 70, from someone likely within the Pauline circle, about deep intimacy with God, about entering the heavenly holy of holies, which is liturgical and Eucharistic as the means of entering heaven on earth. A document which calls Christians to persevere in faith to their heavenly home, embracing the heavenly character of the new covenant. That's exciting historically. But it's also exciting for us because we too are in a wilderness wandering. We too are journeying to our ultimate homeland, heaven itself. And the message of Hebrews is this, in and through the glory of the new covenant, we right now share in that heavenly reality. Salvation is not just about the future, it's happening now. It's God's work of not just forgiving, but healing and transforming. In and through the new covenant, in and through Christ, who has reconciled heaven and earth, we share in that heavenly reality now, if we have the eyes of faith to see do we recognize, do we realize the heavenly grandeur that is in our midst? Do we recognize Christ's presence in our midst, especially in the Holy Eucharist? For wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. And wherever the Eucharist is, there is the king. Well, Dr. Swafford, thank you for your, your great introduction, and it leaves you wanting wanting more. You know, as, as as we mentioned earlier, you go into the Old Testament, and you you see how God is dealing with Israel, and you mentioned two things, imitation and participation back in the Old Testament, but that's also true in the New. Absolutely. And, and you think about, think about all the sacraments, and all the sacraments Christ acts by his power. But in the Eucharist, you have Christ himself. He is the principal act of the liturgy. So it becomes the mass becomes not just the offering of the head, but the offering of the head and the entire body of Christ as we're offered up in him, with him, and through him to the Father. When you go back to the Old Testament, when you're dealing with the tabernacle of Mount Sinai, that was pretty unique. And when you come now to the New Testament with Christ as the, the great high priest, 
something is taking place, which you're going to get into in your teaching, that is so unique. It's the most unique, and most powerful experience in the world. There's no gathering. There is no Bible study. There's no conference or seminar that even comes close. What is the heart of the Mass as far as what makes this so different? What's really happening is Christ is the actor, and we're being offered up in him and with him. And I'd encourage you, when you think about the offering of the gifts, when the gifts are brought forth, Place your fears, your doubts, your concerns, your worries, everything that is in you and part of you on that altar. Because when you go to Mass, you are literally going to heaven on earth. And you are entering into Christ's sacrifice, which took place at the Last Supper, on the cross, and continues in heaven. That is what you're entering into if we have the eyes of faith to see. Imitation, participation. We're going to move on now to the first two chapters of the letter to the Hebrews. You're back. All right. Excellent. Um, you know what? I, I may need to, I don't think I turned off my, no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. All right, you guys, where, are, where did you go? I'm right here. We're right here. We can see you just beautifully. Oh, and you can because oh, yeah. I don't see you guys. Okay. Well, that's okay. I don't need to. I don't need to. I'm not going to mess with it. Okay. Um, I can't see you guys, but you can hear me, and that's what counts. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I I loved two things right off the bat on this, and one is that his audience is on Zoom. You can tell this is like so pandemic era. His audience is on Zoom. And and second, did you get a load of his Bible? There, I mean, I'm looking at his Bible, and you can tell that he's been over this many times by the different colors of ink that he has used to highlight his Bible. It's um, you know, oh, to be that steeped in scripture. That's that's my prayer is to Lord. You know, give me the endurance, give me the the wherewithal to be that steeped in scripture. The um the advice that he gave at the very end about place yourself on the altar. <clears throat> I had uh an occasion um probably about 10 years ago. Uh a very dear friend of mine was was having some pretty serious issues with one of her children. And she was convinced that this young man needed an exorcism. So um, she made an appointment to talk to the man who at the time was the, um, the diocesan exorcist. And um, uh, he gave her what I thought was the best advice ever. And he said, look, you know, I know you go to daily mass. When you, when it comes to the the part of the mass where they're bringing up the gifts, so clearly this was before um, before COVID, when we actually had people bringing up gifts, he said, place your son inside the chalice, because what's going to happen in that chalice? It, it's it, what's going to happen is the 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 contents will be transformed that wine and that water will be transformed into the body blood soul and divinity of Jesus Christ if you place your son in that chalice the graces you are you are asking the lord to shower and permeate your loved one your son with those graces that by the merits of his blood, by his by the merits of his precious blood, and the sacri the paschal sacrifice, he will be transformed. And the long the to make that long story short, her son did give up drugs, was um, brought back to a normal 
uh, uh, life and and went back to college, finished his degree, and he's now quite successful. Um, so all of that, when he this guy at the time was living on the river because the dad had kicked him out of the house. He was tired of him stealing everything and hawking all their valuables. And so um, that advice from from it was not obviously not an exorcism. And that's something that each one of us can do with our concerns. And, you know, if, if we have a loved one that we're or even maybe it's us, you know, place ourselves inside that chalice and imagine the the sacred species um, covering us. There's a little tiny prayer book called Precious Blood and, Blood and Mother. And inside of it is exactly what you're talking about. The, the nuns in this little monastery back east. And they place in the chalice the souls of the, de, uh, the, the uh, faithful departed. Mm. And on the patent, they place you and whatever concerns on the patent. So similar to what you're talking about. It's absolutely lovely. It's something I've done for the last 30 years because... It's our participation. It's like you say, it's our, our, we are actually becoming part of that beautiful gift of offertory. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have taken that story. Even though I only went to accompany her, I took that advice to heart. And, and, you know, there's tremendous consolation in doing that. Um, I also, uh, let me change the subject. I cannot emphasize enough how good this book is. It's part of the Catholic commentary series. It's on the the letter to the Hebrews. And um, it, it has everything that's covered in the video plus. And so if you if you really want to steep yourself in this study, I highly recommend um, that you, it's by Mary Healy, um, a well-known contemporary uh, theologian, and uh, it's just excellent. I've used this a lot in in my preparation for for these studies. The other thing I want to mention is just to give an overall description of this study, which I failed to do at the beginning. We have, there are eight sessions in this study. And in each session, except one, we're going to take two chapters. So the next session, which will be session two, and um, Denise, I, I'm sure we already have a date set for that. Yes. Uh, so, and it's the fourth Saturday. Yes, ma'am. That date is the 25th, which is the presentation of our Lord. How how neat. Yes. It's also March 25th is the day of the Feast of the Annunciation. Uh, so that's also um, a good one. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I? Yeah, it is the Annunciation, isn't it? Yeah. I'm looking far at my calendar and I, I saw, it, saw it as a presentation, but is that the same day? The, the 25th of March. Yeah. Is that the same day as the presentation? No. No, no, okay, the, okay, yeah. Presentation. Okay. presentation is the 2nd of February. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 The eight it was supposed to be eight days after the right, the birth. right, right. So that so in the next session we're going to be looking at Hebrews one and two, uh, where we're exploring uh, the Eternal Son as the Royal High Priest. There are also some catechism uh, paragraphs that go with that, and you know there's a there's a reading list that I'm somehow I don't I don't know how to do it, uh, but I will take a um a screenshot and send it to you denise okay and, and then you can I will get it out to everyone yes okay um so for the next session if you look at the catechism paragraphs 457 through 460 so 50 457 58 59 and 60 okay. and then 464 Okay. Paragraph 469 and paragraph 478. So take a look at, at, at a bare minimum, <laughs> look at, uh, read, actually, to read all of Hebrews takes 45 minutes. So if you find a, a quiet place to sit 
for 45 minutes. You can read all of Hebrews in your mind, read it as if you were proclaiming it at mass. And you'll get you'll get the feeling of the the reading. And then uh, you can, you know, do that uh, um, quickly, you know, as if you were lecturing and then go back and slowly read Hebrews one and two chapters one and two. And that'll be the, what we'll look at in the next session. So Anna, just to clarify <clears throat> your catechism uh, chapters again, 457 to 460. Okay. 464, 469, and 478. Interesting, because uh, those that are doing the catechism in the year with Father Michael Schmidt, we're almost yes. in the very, we're almost in the same uh, place right now. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. What yeah. a wonderful study that is. I yes. got behind, so I'm behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is excellent. It really and, is. And if yes. you did not do Bible in a year, uh, that's also on, available um, uh, on his podcasts through Ascension Press. And if you have not done that, it is well worth your time. The catechism is like 20 minutes. Uh, each session is like 20 minutes. And and it's excellent. Uh, a number of people in our parish are doing that. Um, let's see. I think I think I covered what I needed to cover wanted to talk about the structure uh, uh, uh. well i'm i'm so glad you brought up the spirit of the liturgy i read that years ago and gave it to gave my book to father jeff who was now i think the head of the salvatorians in the area so yes um, jeff yeah. Wilkin. yes yeah. and in fact he's here by the way visiting in sacramento really yes he's here wow. for a week wow like for a week um Let's see the probably the the one thing I wanted to he uh, um, uh, Dr. Wolford mentioned it, but I just want to um, uh, emphasize. So um, the author is not putting down Judaism, but he sees that these uh, um, you know people who were former formerly um, you know uh, Jews practicing Jews converted to Christianity, and now he sees them backsliding like they have forgotten. They, they have forgotten what attracted them to Christianity in the first place. And he reminds them that the, the old covenant, great institutions of Torah and, and the temple were very good. But what we get in the new covenant is divine is better so that the 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 old covenant is temporary and the the new covenant is eternal and so the the difference is what what belonged to the old covenant was just a prelude to what we get in the new covenant in the new and eternal covenant and the whole Hebrew scripture is a foretelling of something that is better and yet to come. And that better and yet to come is the new and eternal covenant introduced to us at the Last Supper by Jesus. That is the main point he wants to make. And that we have a great high priest who sits at the right hand of God. Uh, so that's that's the that's the whole study in a nutshell. And the next seven sessions will unpack the details of that. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have any questions before we go or any comments? I have a question. Yes. Um, you said that uh, this uh, letter applies very well to our current times or something like that in your when you you know and I was wondering, I was waiting for to something to hear about how that applies to our current times. Well, uh, uh, let me just, that's a teaser that uh, keep, <laughs> keep following the study. You're, you will be amazed when, when you, we start taking a look at the, at, you know, verse by verse and paragraph by paragraph in the study. Some parts of this letter to the Hebrews sound like 
the author was writing last week. You know, that, that the author is so familiar with what's going on right now in our world today. What he's writing, you know, which which actually I found very comforting that, you know, there's there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's just new expressions of it. Um, the the same issues that we're facing this community, uh, this this anonymous community um, we're facing today. You know the, the the overwhelming influence of current culture, um, the you know the the uh, the the overshadowing or the attempt to overshadow the treasure that we have in in this you know Christian inheritance uh, that that the the dominant culture tries to push it out of the way and overshadow it. That's happening today. And boy, if you have teenagers, you you see it uh, blatantly. So uh, I do have a question on him. Yes, um, I I was I was listening. I thought pretty intently, but I didn't hear him speak about the 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 fact that it's the letter to the Hebrews. I assume that it's Hebrew Christians, obviously. Yes. But it was interesting. It's interesting to me that it's titled the Hebrews. As opposed to uh, a letter to the Corinthians. Or, right. or, the, or to Christians everywhere or whatever, you know, those right. that believe in the, in the, in the, you know, Jesus Christ. It's, it was just interesting that it was, and I don't think he discussed that, did he? Um, no, not really. But, but where it is discussed is in, um, the, ah, the okay in the book here. okay so what so when my comments about uh, and also um i have a couple of other commentaries on scripture that that i've consulted my favorite is the jerome biblical commentary ah. um and and both of those talk about how the the community that this letter was directed to had at one time you know, left Judaism behind, accepted Christianity, and were very fervent. But enough time has passed that, and maybe that first generation is starting to die off. And the second generation just doesn't have the same zeal, the same fervor as, you know, their parents did. So, so there's some backsliding. And, um, and so what the author is, is, uh, exhorting them to do is remember what remember what attracted you in the first place. You know, remember what the promises are and what we have in our great high priest. That the 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 sacrifices of the temple uh, were just you no. Know, although they were good, they had to be repeated. And what will come through in this study is that the, the paschal sacrifice of Christ in his passion, death, and resurrection was once for all. And that the heavenly liturgy, it, that what our liturgy does is participate in the heavenly liturgy. Very I, thought it, I thought it, I wondered whether it might be a little play on the prophets of old who appealed to the Hebrews to return to the truth of what they had known. And, and it was a reminder for, for them that the prophets also had to exhort their people to, yeah. to go to back remember to, the covenant, to remember, to remember the, covenant. the covenant. Yeah. And, yeah. And be, and be faithful to the covenants. And right. what, what this author is saying is, remember your baptism yes remember yes. your conversion what yes. attracted you in the first place and remember go that your that. ancestors had to go through the very same thing yes exactly. exactly yeah that's interesting so, so another thing yes. that i noticed was that it wasn't Jeff doing most of the talking. Oh, you and guys! I, he I have was to, so good, though. I was he even, was. I was so, I was so ready is. to be disappointed, and he was great. <laughs> he is. He is. I was going to say that. So why don't we? Um, let's not forget uh, to end in prayer. And I know that there's a lot of things that we need to pray for. One of the things that I am praying for is the success of the the American bishops um campaign 
uh, this Eucharistic revival campaign. I don't know that it's really kicked off um, um, seriously in our diocese, but it has in other, <clears throat> excuse me, in other dioceses, and it will eventually. Um, and and I'm I'm praying that uh, that the Holy Spirit that there will be a great and mighty movement of the Holy Spirit and bring people back to the Eucharist and to the liturgy. And may I add um, uh, today, my Aunt Jeanette passed away this morning. This is one of my mother's um, sisters. And actually now this leaves my mother as the oldest. So she was 99 um, and she did get a chance to be with the priest. She woke up from her coma. Um, I spoke to her son, Randy, yesterday and she did wake up from her coma while the priest was there, but she passed away early this morning. So I'd like to remember her. Yeah, Jeanette. So God bless her. Ninety-nine years. That's amazing. Yeah, she would have been a hundred in August, and she wanted to make it oh. so desperately. So yeah. Well, she, she was an amazing her. woman. Amazing woman. And I have something to pray for too. Uh, uh, my art parish here, Sacred Heart of Jesus, here in Grand Rapids. Uh, they are. They filed a lawsuit against uh, certain members of the government of the state of Michigan on the uh, issue of uh, not having to hire transgender and homosexual people. And so they're on the forefront. And I think it's Alliance Defending Freedom is representing them. So please pray for my parish that they win this lawsuit. Uh, anyway, that's why. And if you want to look it up, Alliance Defending Freedom, I think, has a, 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 a website or you know, web page uh, on this lawsuit, and you can you look at you can look at the complaint in the case. It's a long complaint, lays it all out. It was a verified complaint, so the pastor had to sign the. You know, you say you sign under penalty of perjury that, that as far as he knows, everything stated in that complaint is true and correct, and uh, it was it's a really big it's a big case. Yeah. So anyway. Um. Yeah. You know, I, I used to work in um, in discrimination law. And one of the things that, you know, that you learn early on, I you know, I'm not a lawyer, not like you, but I, I you know, early on, you learn that there are bona fide occupational qualifications. And clearly, you know, obviously teaching in a Catholic school um, would be, you know, it, it's reasonable to require um, your teachers to be in good standing with the Catholic Church if they're teaching in a Catholic school. Um, so uh, you know they they certainly have that going for them. What would what would be difficult would be if they have made exceptions for others in the past or even currently. Um, you know so in fact, I should clarify a little bit the, the parish has filed a lawsuit on behalf of, the school, which is part of the parish, yes, uh, Sacred Heart of uh, Jesus Academy, which is a wonderful school, and uh, and but yeah, so so hiring people, and I think, and the bishop actually asked this particular parish to file this lawsuit because this parish, I hear exactly what you're saying, they have not, they don't, <laughs> they don't cut corners in any subject matter, so they're not going to be they do uh, background check subject to the yes that they yeah. were critical and they're not applying it across the board. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, there are other schools that don't do that. Right, so right. They would be hard pressed to uh, to sue. Um, but good for them and good for you guys. I, I am going to look it up. Yeah. Thank um, you. And, you know, obviously, we still want to pray for the people of Ukraine and we want to pray that Our Lady Queen of Peace will will bring peace in the world, um, in all the places where it's where it's needed, uh, including in our own country. Uh, well, well, you know, there's not outright, um, you know, combat. Um, there certainly is uh, spiritual warfare going on in our own country. So. Um, how about if we do the three Hail Marys? Uh, there is no better advocate for us than our Blessed Mother, the Queen Mother, the in Hebrew, the Gibberah, 
the the lady of the house, the Gibara, the queen mother, whose uh, job it would be to be an advocate for her people and to take take her people's concerns, uh, if she agrees with them, to her son, the king. Um, uh, and so our, our Blessed Mother, who is the, the mother of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, uh, there is no better advocate. So let's do the three Hail Marys in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of the unborn, pray for us. Our Lady of Ukraine, pray for us. Our Lady of Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just realized something. I'm not sure if it was the case before, but has Zoom changed so that now I can both speak and hear at the same moment? Uh, you know what? I It, it has changed. And what, it, well, I noticed that when I logged in. Really? Um, yeah. And also where things are on my screen is a little different, which is why I am not able to put myself back into the picture and before I could just you know go to the bottom go to my my like you know where all the icons are at the bottom uh and plug myself back in but I can't do that now huh. you know I think I've been able to hear and speak at the same time but it did change a little bit because they offer a dock now on the side that gives you more options but um I don't know about the 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 hearing part of it Rick so so it just seemed like we were more in the same room today. I don't know why. Ah, well, oh, good. that's good. That's, that's good. good. That's yeah. a good thing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, without any further ado, all our our um, next session is on a wonderful feast day. Yes. Um, and as uh, as I learned from Father Pepka, the feast of the Annunciation is actually older than Christmas, uh, and and the date for Christmas part of why it's set for December twenty fifth. Yeah, um, is because it's nine months after March 25th. That's right. So um, uh, that, I found that interesting that the Annunciation would be older than yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Anyway, um, shalom. Well, thank shalom. you. And thank I, you, Anna, very much. See you. Shalom. shalom. Denise, Denise. Yes, ma'am. Communication at you sound about classes. Classes are ending. At the end oh, of yes. Well, we oh, mention. yes. Well, Anna can speak to this, too. She's our secretary. So, um, yes, go ahead, I'm Anna. A terrible, I'm a terrible secretary. Yes, yes she's not. <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the nonprofit Easter's Faith Formation Center is um, is dissolving. And um, and part of the part of the problem is we don't have anybody who's technically competent to, you know to to be able to do all of what we need to do on zoom and um and it's just you know it, it's overwhelming us and overwhelming our our skill level so um uh, and and our, when we when we our first CPA. Started, yes yeah. our, our cpa we've talked him into at least staying on until the end of june um and, and uh, it is to be a nonprofit really requires a lot of paperwork and a lot of administration, none of which the rest of us are capable of doing. Um, so our, our CPA is retiring and, and leaving us. And so it prompted a conversation among all of the board members. And so we decided that when we first started Easter's Faith Formation Center, there wasn't a lot going on in the diocese and we were you know the the biggest game in town 
since then, other parishes have taken up. Um, you know, I look at Good Shepherd or I look at uh, uh, um, Presentation um, and, you know, a Holy Trinity up in El Dorado. They have taken up the, you know, and, and taken on adult education, um, you know, very seriously, uh, which, you know, is is relatively new. So the the pressing need for us um you know, is is not as pressing as it used to be. So, um, you know, long story short, we will be dissolving the nonprofit at the end of of uh, June. So June 30th will be our, our last, um, that's, that'll be our ending date. So um, we're not, we're not asking for, and we're not, you know, really accepting, uh, or we're, we're not encouraging um, uh donations to the nonprofit. So uh, classes may or may not continue, but if they continue, excuse me, I have to let my dog out. Um, if they continue, um, it, they, it would not be under the, the cover of our nonprofit. So, so legally, we cannot accept um, donations because we're not, you know, no longer a nonprofit. I'm going to finish, you know, this is this class, this study is eight sessions, and that should bring us to sometime in May. The next the next study I had planned was on the Psalms, and that's 10 sessions. So that that would not take us. Uh, I mean, that would take us well beyond our our ending day. So um, so it looks like this is going to be my last well, I'm I'm just going to chime in here because because if we are able to keep the Zoom going because the Zoom is a cost, and so we'll know more about that as the months progress because we're still paying, you know, um, a couple of the teachers, and and of course then we're we're still paying a little bit for rent at Easter's not a whole lot just a tiny tiny bit in comparison. And um, and in fact, we can move into the Rayleigh's, which is is no cost at all. But um, I'm going to press Anna into service again if we can keep the uh, Zoom going. And again, it wouldn't be under the EFFC guys, but it would be just a community gathering, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and I'm I'm fine with that, you know. I'm, okay, good, <laughs> good. I'm fine with that. We hate to lose this, um, this beautiful, and 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 that's what's happening with the groups that meet together is they don't want to break because it's you know Rick and Doris both, um, and at least anybody that's attended those classes, you form a bond and the fellowship needs to continue. So um, it's really just a dismantling of the of of the EFFC, and as I've told the other classes, we'll have to figure out a way to um, maybe just hand you know Father Pepka a check or whatever you know or cash, and the same thing with John. So that's kind of how we're. It's just we're kind of feeling our way to go forward, but we we don't want it to end because there's still people that are are being you know um lifted yeah. by it yeah the uplift. So, yeah yeah and, and i have to say i'm one of them you know me too uh, me too <laughs> i look forward i i absolutely look forward to these studies because it forces me to go back and refresh my refresh myself on what i what i had studied so it's good this yeah. is very good I can't let this go by without as an opportunity to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Denise and Anna and all those involved with Easter's Faith Formation Center, all the classes I've attended over the years. It's been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, well, thank you, thank you. And thanks to, I thanks thanks to you for being a supporter. Uh, yeah. Thank you, but you know, thank you all of you, you who all have supported it. Yes, absolutely. Because we couldn't have done it without y'all. So you know, that's it, true. That's, that's why true. it's such an it's, it's such an important thing to keep it going if we can. You know, so yeah. Okay. So okay. Can I, so I'm Doris, going. pray for us. Yes, please oh, pray am. for us. Yes, I thank you. Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Twenty-fifth. Yes, ma'am. Oh. All right. God bless y'all. Thank you for showing up. Okay. All right. Hello.
שלום, שבת שלום. שלום, שבת. שבת שלום.